So as you've seen today, uh, today's been kind of a missions Sunday, and obviously the message here is going to connect with that theme as well, good news to the world. Have we come to see and recognize as the followers of Jesus that this is our calling, that this good news we've been talking about needs to be taken to the whole world? I, I wonder if the people of God over the centuries have actually given the impression that God isn't for the world. I think back to the early days of Christianity, and even when the, the Lord was training his own disciples, and it's so clear to see in the Gospels the way that they and all of the Jewish people felt about people like the Samaritans, right? I mean, the story of the Good Samaritan was a shocking, shocking story to the Jewish people because their natural instinct was to hate the Samaritan. If you go back and read the Gospels carefully, you'll find that Jesus actually takes his disciples out of the realm of, of Israel into, into northern regions or on the other side of the Sea of Galilee where he heals a, a man filled with demons. That was actually non-Jewish territory, and Jesus takes his disciples to those places. Why? Because he's actually helping to train them to, to overcome their natural prejudice. But even after he's commissioned his disciples, and he's gone back to earth, and as Charlotte shared, he told them, you're going to take the gospel first to Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. But if you trace the story through the book of Acts, you'll find how difficult it was, even for the Lord's apostles, to take that step. So Peter, who was one of the first apostles to actually preach the good news to non-Jewish people, how did that happen? It happened because God gave him a supernatural vision of a sheet coming down from heaven full of all these different kinds of meat, which normally Jewish people wouldn't eat, and a voice, a supernatural voice saying, hey, Peter, eat this. And Peter's saying, no, no, we don't, we don't eat those things, Lord. That was a vision that was meant to help him overcome his prejudice, not about food, but towards non-Jewish people. So in Acts chapter 10, we find Peter, because of supernatural circumstances, going to the home of a non-Jewish man and preaching the gospel and watching the evidence of the Holy Spirit coming upon this family in salvation. And it was like a revelation to Peter. Even though Jesus had been teaching his disciples, this is the plan all along. You know, even up to the current day, I would say that many evangelical Christians in the West have given the world and people around us the impression that God isn't really for the nations. Many evangelical Christians have fallen into a kind of political ideal of nationalism, of protectionism, where we're actually offended by immigrants coming to our country. And let's check our own hearts here, because this, we're, we're seeing this all around us. You can't order a coffee from Tim Hortons without meeting someone from another country. And what is our attitude towards immigration and refugees? Have we, or have you, have I, given the impression by the way I act towards people different than me, people from other parts of the world, that God is not for the nations? I fear that we have. And so we got to go back to the Bible and find the evidence, which is all through the scripture, that God is for the nations, that God really does so love the world, not just our part of the world, not just people in the world that speak my language, not just people in the world with my color of skin, but the whole world of people God loves and wants to redeem. So we're going to do a flyover of scripture and see the evidence of this from God's word. We're not going to get to all of the scriptures. This is going to be uh, just a, a quick flyover. There's so many others. So go to Bible Gateway and type in the word nations. Type in the word peoples. Type in the word languages. And find scriptures all throughout the Bible that show us God's love, yes, for the whole world. So we begin here in Genesis 1. And 28, with that first couple, Adam and Eve, who were given this command, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. That was God's intention, that the whole world would be filled with people who know him and follow him and see his glory. But sin came into the world, and we won't even mention the worldwide flood, but here in Genesis 11... The population of the world had gathered into one place, and they decide to build this tower 
that's called the Tower of Babel. And it's like they're trying to, instead of, notice here, instead of spreading out and filling the earth the way God had said in, in Genesis chapter 1, it's, it's like this group of people is saying, no, we're going we're gonna to gather in this space. We are going to be a people. And anyone who's out there, they will be our enemies. And so they try to build this tower to make a name for themselves. We read that God comes down, confused the language of the whole world. And from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. This, by the way, gives us a pretty simple explanation of how, how did we end up with all of these different uh, ethnicities around our world with people who look different and talk different and different languages and different cultures and different behaviors. It really started here where God scattered the people because in sin and pride, humanity was saying, no, we're not going to fill the earth. And God said, yes, you will. And God himself, in a very real sense, is the author of all of the ethnicities we see in our world. Then in the very next chapter, God calls to Abraham who would be the initial patriarch, the father of the Jewish nation. And of course, the Jewish nation were God's chosen people, his special people. But notice, and, and you'll see this all throughout their history, that God's intention was never Israel and no one else. It was Israel to reach everyone else. Have you ever seen that in God's word? It's right here in the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 12. We call this the Abrahamic covenant. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You see, God's intention was not just to bless Israel, but through Israel to bless everyone, which ultimately he will do through the coming of Israel's King Jesus. And then we find Throughout the Old Testament, God gives his people, Israel, laws. And in these laws, we see God's concern, not just for Israel, but for the nations. He says, I've taught you decrees and laws. Observe them carefully, for this will show wisdom and understanding to the nations. Who will hear about these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And what was the intended result? That the nations would come to Israel and say, we, we'd like to follow your God. We'd like to, to follow your ways. We're impressed by your laws, by your faith, and by the God that you worship. Some of these laws were very specific about how they should treat non-Jewish people. The Lord, your God, love these verses, God of gods, Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves, here it is so clearly, he loves the foreigner residing among you. Feel the weight of this as we think of those people we might think of as foreigners when we go out into the world or we go to Tim Hortons or the grocery store and we meet people who were not born here in Canada and maybe we struggle to understand them. And we need to hear this, that God loves the foreigner. This is the heart of God. This should be the heart of God's people, us. We should love the foreigner residing among us. It says that God gives them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners. For you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. See, this is the baseline of it all. Is that when it really comes down to it, what, what we need to remember is that we, we were the foreigners. We were foreigners from God. Because of our sin, we, we were separated from God. We had no rights in his world or in his family or in his nation. But God in his love through the gospel has reached us and made us his own. So why would we then turn and, and turn our backs and close our hearts to others who are still foreigners from God? It makes no sense for us to do that. This idea of reaching the nations is in the songs of Israel, And there's many examples, but here's one from Psalm 67, 1 to 4. May God bless us. This is the Jewish people singing this song. May he bless us. Make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth. Your salvation among all nations. You see, they're singing the Abrahamic covenant. This is exactly what God had promised to Abraham. I'm going to bless you so that through you, the world, the nations can be blessed. This is what they're singing about. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. You see, they're not, they're not crying out here for God to crush the nations, 
but for the nations to find joy and salvation in God. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. And then we find many references in the prophets. Listen to me, my people. Hear me, my nation. Instruction will go out from me. My justice will become a light to the nations. My righteousness draws near speedily. My salvation is on the way and my arm will bring justice to the nations. And then it gets very specific about how God will do that. He will do that through his promised king, Jesus. Here are these famous prophetic verses about Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, which of course he fulfilled in his life. But notice the words that come right after. Rejoice greatly. Your king comes to you lowly and riding on a donkey. This is year, hundreds of years before Jesus came. And then it says, he will proclaim peace to the nations. So then Jesus comes on the scene. He's the promised hope. He's the one that ultimately is going to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. That through uh, the, the king of the Jews, salvation will come from the Jews to the whole world, to all the nations. So notice when Jesus is born. His first worshipers. Have you ever thought about how ironic, how, how surprising, how, and yet how wonderful this is? His first worshipers were non-Jewish. The first people to recognize that God had done this astounding miracle, that he fulfilled his promise, that he'd sent his promised one, were these non-Jewish men who'd come from the east. We don't know how far. We don't know if they were oriental or if they'd come more from present-day Iraq. But they came from the east, and they knew that the king of the Jews had been born. Somehow God had revealed this to them. And they came, it says, to worship him. And then we, we have this story of how the star reappears. It leads them to this tiny village of Bethlehem. And they find Jesus. And they literally offer their riches to him. The first to comprehend that Jesus was who scripture said he was. To offer him rightful worship. Were these, we could say, pagan wise men. Who'd come from the east. And then... When Jesus was a child, a baby, taken to the temple for the offering that was meant for the firstborn. And there a man, an elderly man named Simeon, led by the Holy Spirit, comes to the temple. He had been waiting his whole life to meet the Messiah, the, the coming one. And somehow the Holy Spirit reveals to him, okay, he's here, the baby's coming today. And he somehow knows that Mary and Joseph and Jesus is the one and takes him up in his arms and he says this my eyes praying to God my eyes have seen your salvation which you've prepared in the sight of all nations a light for revelation to the Gentiles when Matthew writes his gospel and gives us the genealogy of Jesus he is so careful to show us that embedded in the genealogy of Jesus this one who we would have thought would have to have the, the purest bloodline to be the king of the Jews, and yet we find here, describing his ancestors, this guy named Salmon, who's the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Rahab, of course, was a Canaanite prostitute, rescued by God after the spies somehow ended up in her home in Joshua chapter 2, and then when the walls of Jericho fall down, yet she living in that wall, and I can almost imagine the whole wall fell down except one part because it says that she lived in the wall, that she hung this scarlet cord from the window. If you haven't read all this, uh, Joshua chapter 6. And the people of Israel go in and obviously defeat the city of Jericho, but rescue Rahab, who not only comes into the Israelite community, but becomes a great, great, etc. grandmother of Jesus. And then Boaz marries this woman, Ruth, who is a Moabitess woman. God had said that no Moabite would ever, ever be allowed to enter into Jewish community. I think to illustrate his grace, because sure enough, this woman, Ruth, who was from Moab, was welcomed into God's community and literally became 
a great grandmother, etc., of Jesus. And then we find in the ministry of Jesus, and we can talk about a number of stories, but when he cleared the temple of all of those money makers trying to make money off of worship in God's temple, he quotes from the Old Testament and says, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? God's intention was for his temple, his place of worship, to be a place where all could come to meet him and find salvation in him. Jesus, near the end of his ministry, begins to talk about the future. And he says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. How seriously do we take this promise? Because the reality is that we are intended to be the fulfillment of this promise. We don't read this and think, well, I guess God's going to raise someone up to take the good news to all the nations. It's us. We are the followers of Jesus who are meant to fulfill this promise. This verse has been mentioned already today, the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Jesus says to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. And you say, oh, well, he gave them that instruction. Yeah, but the very next thing he says is teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, which is what he just commanded them, which was to go and make disciples of all nations. So we can't escape this responsibility, this task that is still upon us today if we are the followers of Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus promised repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations Beginning in Jerusalem and then in Acts 1, just before he ascends, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then in Acts chapter 2, the very first act of the church, the very first miracle of the church is what? God enables his disciples to speak in the nation's languages. A crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia. Can't you believe I can say these names so well? <laughs> Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Rome, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. The birth of the church happened when God enabled his people to speak in the languages of the world. And no wonder as we come to the end of the Bible... And we get now this heavenly vision of the consummation of all things, of the end of all things. And we read these wonderful words. I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne. Can you believe, and have you ever thought, that once we all get to heaven, people from Africa and Asia and North America... We'll all just kind of be melted down into one pot and we'll all be the same. And the reality is that God's not going to do that. It seems that Jesus actually suggests that in terms of gender, gender isn't going to be the same in the eternal state. But our languages and our ethnicities, the identity of who we were as nations will remain. God is not going to melt us all down into one pot. All of us standing there before the, th the throne, they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. Revelation 15, great and awe-inspiring are your works, Lord God. This is the worship of heaven. Just and true are your ways, king of the nations, right? Not king of the Jews here, not just king of the church, king of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship before you because your righteous acts have been revealed. And then the description finally in Revelation 21 and 22 of this eternal city where we will dwell with Jesus. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine in it for the glory of God gives it light. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it. In Revelation 22, the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing down the middle of the great street. Try to, try to picture this, by the way. There's a river flowing down the street, and there's a tree on both sides. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, one tree, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. This is the heart of God. This is the program of God. Now, we have got work to do, so Phil's going to come back up and tell us a little bit 
about how desperately uh, this gospel is still needed in various parts of the world. Thank you, Gary. And I hope for each of you, as, we, as Gary's just done this fly through scripture, that we've seen what an amazing opportunity we have, what an amazing responsibility we have, but we don't do it on our own. God is at work and God is inviting us, his people, those whom he's redeemed to participate in what he is doing. But yes, as Gary said, there is still a lot of work to be done. This picture, this slide was up earlier. This is from um, the Joshua Project. Those of you that know the Joshua Project, they track unreached people groups around the world. Well, they track sort of all ethnic groups around the world and track to what extent has the gospel made inroads into those communities. If it's green, there's significant gospel presence in that community. If it's yellow, there's work to be done. If it's red, it means there's a huge amount of work to be done. Now, the 1040 window is between 10 degrees north and 40 degrees north latitude. So that's what you see there. And running from, as you see there, the west coast of Africa right through Asia. The vast majority of people in the world that do not have the opportunity to understand who Jesus is live in that part of the world. Now, as you look at that map, if you know anything about current events and world geography, you will also know that that is not necessarily the easiest part of the world to live. But there are billions of people that live in that part of the world that do not yet know Christ. Here's another way to look at it. And this is um, information put together um, by the Center for the Study of Global Christianity. And looking at, you know, where are those nations or those places that would describe themselves as majority Christian? And I'm saying majority Christian because many of the people in this world that might call themselves Christian may not even know and be in a living relationship with Jesus. So if we could have the data to do that, this would be even a more stark picture. But we don't have that for global across the world. But even at this, when we're just talking, those people that say, yes, I'm a Christian, whether or not they're in a living relationship with Jesus. Look at the same area of the world, 1040 window across Middle East, North Africa, Central Asia, South Asia, huge parts of the world where people live and die without hearing of Jesus. And this information comes from a very current version of the World Christian Encyclopedia put together by the Center for the Study of Global Christianity in 2020. Now just take a look at the part of the world there that is pink. And I know this is not the same map, but... The bits that are highlighted there, you can see North Africa through the Middle East into Central Asia. This is the cover of a book from 1911. 122 years ago, Samuel Zwemner, who was a missionary focusing on reaching out to Muslims in the world, where is there a gospel need? Where was there a gospel need 110, 112 years ago? It hasn't changed much. Now, that should break our hearts. Because how many generations of people, how many billions of people live in that part of the world and have never had the opportunity to hear that Jesus loves them? Country of Mali. Some, some of you like maps and data. I know some of you like stories. Country of Mali. Mali. People group called the Hassaniya. In 2020, there was one. There was one person who called themselves Hassaniya who would say, I'm a follower of Jesus. Not a, not a huge group of people, but thousands of people among the Hassaniya, one person said that they would follow Jesus. In 2020, the second one became a follower of Jesus. That represents twice as many people in that group of people that now know and would say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. That's one person. 
Those are the stories that we need to hear. That is what God has called us to do. Friends here at Wallenstein, we may not have the opportunity in and of ourselves to make ourselves the impact among the billions. That is God's job. But you know what? He's asked us to be a part of it. Samuel Zwemner was saying that in 1911. The picture doesn't look much different. What have we been doing? Gary's just run through scripture. It is clear what God's heart is. As we think about access to scripture, my friend from Wycliffe just sent me this one recently. 5.9 billion people in the world have access to the whole Bible in their own language. Just shy of 800 million people have the New Testament in their language. 446 million people have portions of the scripture in their language. 129 million people are still waiting for translation to begin. 75 million people know that there is some translation work beginning in their language and another 10 million people scattered in small places. The assessment is they probably don't need the language, the Bible translated in their own language because they also speak other languages. My friends, this is just to get the Bible translated so you can read it, let alone to come to faith, let alone to be discipled, to help others find and follow Jesus. That is what God has called us to do. Yes, here, but around the world. And we do that. And look where missionaries are. And remember back to those first slides where people live and die without hearing of Jesus. The easy places are where we go. I'm putting myself in that boat. Now, we lived in northern Ghana, which was on the edge of the 1040 window. That was not an easy place. And I'm not saying that we only look at this because as we think about the billions of people that live and die without hearing God's good news, you know what? There are men and women and children with unique faces and a name. They're not just numbers. They're people made in the image of God that God loves. And he desires that they come into a loving, redemptive relationship with Jesus. They're not just one of a billion people. They're a unique person that Jesus loves. And God has called us to them. And they need us. They need Christ's church from around the world. Charlotte talked about missionaries coming from all over the world. And I've... Andrew and I have had the privilege of working alongside people from around the world in some of these challenging communities, but there is still a need where people struggle to access, just access the gospel. This doesn't mean being in a discipling relationship. There is a huge, huge need. Globally, 87% of all Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists so that's 3.6 million people, 87% of that, that's like 3.1 billion people, don't personally know a Christian. This doesn't mean that they, this is the person who says, I'm a Christian. They may not actually be a believer. So if we actually say the number of Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists who know someone who's in a personal relationship with Jesus that percentage is much higher. What is our responsibility? How are we going to respond? And yes, the question is, we get asked it all the time. Why in the West, when the world is coming to us, should we go to the rest of the world? And the reality is, because that is what God has called us to do. To go to Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and to the ends of the earth. And it wasn't, well... Do it in the most cost-effective. Well, they can do it cheaper, so we, we shouldn't go. I'm sorry, people. That does not cut it. God has called us as his people to share his love to the world around us. Do we need to do that on our own? No, we don't. And here at Wallenstein, we partner as a church with mission agencies, who in turn, we partner with others who give us resources Spoken is an organization that helps equip people 
to communicate the gospel in story format. For people that don't read, to hear the gospel in story format. Lausanne, who Russ and Meredith work with, it's a network helping organizations around the world work together. Sending churches around the world, coming together with networks, with resources, coming together some t- many times, hopefully, with even the small churches that might be present closer so that we can take the good news of Jesus to people around the world. We don't do this on our own. It requires humility. It requires perseverance. And it requires commitment. Where does that come from? It comes from our understanding of what Gary has just talked about. The call that God places on us, his people. What does he desire of us to do? And I love, and Gary touched on it, this passage in Revelation. That new city, there's no temple in it. And the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp, and the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. God has given us the opportunity as his people to come to a fuller understanding of what God is like when we engage with the nations around us. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. God is not just wiping nations and cultures off the map. He is redeeming them and that new city in the new earth, those people, the kings of the earth will bring their splendor. The glory and honor of the nations will come into it. And together, together, my friends, we will get to worship the God who redeems and who saves us. Thanks, Gary. So where does our motivation, our encouragement, our courage come from? If we take this task seriously, if we as individuals and as a church say, we want to be part of this, we want to make a difference. It comes from right here, and Charlotte stole a bit of my sermon earlier, Charlotte, but I'll forgive you. She talked about how the first great missionary was Jesus himself. And here are his words to the people in John chapter 6. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So many times in my life I've thought about, like, what, what would it be like if God called me to China or India or somewhere far away where I didn't know the language and I didn't know the people and I didn't know the culture and I feel a nod in my stomach and I feel like I I don't know if I could do that. But we stop for a moment and think about what it was like for Jesus who lived for all eternity in the very presence of God, his Father and the Holy Spirit in loving relationship, in perfect harmony, in perfect glory, in perfect safety. And yet, for our sakes, they chose to create. And when creation rebelled against him, became broken and sinful, Jesus stood from his throne and removed his royal garments and became a missionary to our world in which he was born into a human family, born with a human body, born into poverty, born into a broken culture, broken world, born into a world that ultimately would reject him, hate him, and kill him. And he knew all of this in advance. Not only did Jesus leave behind all the good that he had, he chose to come into all the wreckage of our world to wade out, wade out into it, knowing As a holy, perfect God, he would be himself ultimately tainted by the sin of the world. And here in these verses, we are reminded that not only did he come to be the missionary, he literally gave his life. He died a cruel death in order to provide the message, the hope, the salvation that the world so desperately needed. So our motivation, our encouragement, our model is found right here in the breaking of the bread. 
So we want to take a few moments and give thanks to Jesus. Remember how desperate we would be without his gift of himself, without him coming, without him dying. We need to see beyond the table and hear the words of scripture. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This communion becomes a pattern, a way of life. That just as Jesus allowed his body to be broken, now we as his people are called to follow in the footsteps of his love and sacrifice. And so I ask us as a church, are we ready, are we willing to be broken so that the good news can go to the world that is still lost? Or will we celebrate communion, rest in the provision that we have received, and go home forgetting that there is a whole world of billions of people out there who still desperately need this message? Will we be content to live in our million dollar homes and, and drive our, our vehicles and our boats and our, have our toys and, and just be for, forgetful and fail to follow the pattern that Jesus left for us, that because in him we have everything, we are so secure, we have nothing to fear, we have hope. We of all people can sacrifice so much because we have been given so much. We can say, like Paul, that our lives are being poured out like a drink offering. Is it true of us? Is it true of us as a church? Is it true of us as individuals? May the love and the sacrifice of Jesus become our pattern and our way of life. We're going to sing in closing. If you would stand, take my life and let it be.